a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Woodstock The Woodstock Music and Art Fair, informally, the Woodstock Festival, or simply Woodstock, was a music festival in the United States in 1969 which attracted an audience of more than 400,000. Scheduled for August 15-17 on a dairy farm in the Catskill Mountains of southern New York State, northwest of New York City, it ran over to Monday. Billed as an Aquarian Exposition, Three Days of Peace and Music, it was held at Max Yazga's 600 acres dairy farm near the hamlet of White Lake in the town of Bethel. Located in Sullivan County, Bethel is 43 miles southwest of the town of Woodstock in adjoining Ulster County. During the sometimes rainy weekend, 32 acts performed outdoors before an audience of more than 400,000 people. It is widely regarded as a pivotal moment in popular music history, as well as the definitive nexus for the larger counterculture generation. Rolling Stone listed it as one of the 50 moments that changed the history of rock and roll. The event was captured in the Academy Award-winning 1970 documentary movie Woodstock, an accompanying soundtrack album, and Joni Mitchell's song, Woodstock, which commemorated the event and became a major hit for both Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young and Matthews' Southern Comfort. Joni Mitchell said, Woodstock was a spark of beauty where half a million kids saw that they were part of a greater organism. In 2017, the festival site was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Planning and Preparation Woodstock was initiated through the efforts of Michael Lang, Artie Kornfeld, Joel Rosenman, and John P. Roberts. Roberts and Rosenman financed the project. Lang had some experience as a promoter, having co-organized a small festival on the East Coast the prior year, the Miami Pop Festival, where an estimated 25,000 people attended the two-day event. Early in 1969, Roberts and Rosenman were New York City entrepreneurs. In the process of building Media Sound, a large audio recording studio complex in Manhattan, Lang and Kornfeld's lawyer, Miles Lowry, who had done legal work on the Media Sound project, suggested that they contact Roberts and Rosenman about financing a similar, but much smaller, studio Kornfeld and Lang hoped to build in Woodstock, New York. Unpersuaded by this studio in the woods proposal, Roberts and Rosenman counter proposed a concert featuring the kind of artists known to frequent the Woodstock area. Kornfeld and Lang agreed to the new plan, and Woodstock Ventures was formed in January 1969. The company offices were located in an oddly decorated floor of 47 West 57th Street in Manhattan. Bert Cohen and his design group, Curtain Call Productions, oversaw the psychedelic transformation of the office. From the start, there were differences in approach among the four. Roberts was disciplined and knew what was needed for the venture to succeed, while the laid-back Lang saw Woodstock as a new, relaxed, way of bringing entrepreneurs together. When Lang was unable to find a site for the concert, Roberts and Rosenman, growing increasingly concerned, took to the road and eventually came up with a venue. Similar differences about financial discipline made Roberts and Rosenman wonder whether to pull the plug or to continue pumping money into the project. In April 1969, Credence Clearwater Revival became the first act to sign a contract for the event, agreeing to play for $10,000. The promoters had experienced difficulty landing big-name groups prior to Credence committing to play. Credence drummer Doug Clifford later commented, Once Credence signed, everyone else jumped in line and all the other big acts came on. Given a 3 a.m. start time and a mission from the Woodstock film, Members have expressed bitterness over their experiences regarding the festival. Woodstock was designed as a profit-making venture. It famously became a free concert, only after the event drew hundreds of thousands more people than the organizers had prepared for. Tickets for the three-day event cost $18 in advance and $24 at the gate. Ticket sales were limited to record stores in the greater New York City area, or by mail via a post office box at the Radio City Station post office located in Midtown Manhattan. Around 186,000 advance tickets were sold, and the organizers anticipated approximately 200,000 festival goers would turn up. Selection of the venue The original venue plan was for the festival to take place in Wallachal, New York 
possibly near the proposed recording studio site owned by Alexander Tapus. After local residents quickly shot down that idea, Lang and Kornfeld thought they had found another possible location in Sogotis, New York. But they had misunderstood. As the landowner's attorney made clear, in a brief meeting with Roberts and Rosenman, growing alarmed at the lack of progress, Roberts and Rosenman took over the search for a venue, and discovered the 300-acre Mills Industrial Park in the town of Walkill, New York, which Woodstock Ventures leased for $10,000 in the spring of 1969. Town officials were assured that no more than 50,000 would attend. Town residents immediately opposed the project. In early July, the town board passed a law requiring a permit for any gathering over 5,000 people. On July 15, 1969, the Walkill Zoning Board of Appeals officially banned a concert on the basis that the planned portable toilets would not meet town code. Reports of the ban, however, turned out to be a publicity bonanza for the festival. In his 2007 book Taking Woodstock, Elliot Tiber relates that he offered to host the event on his 15-acre motel grounds, and had a permit for such an event. He claims to have introduced the promoters to dairy farmer Max Yazga. Lang, however, disputes Tiber's account and says that Tiber introduced him to a realtor, who drove him to Yazga's farm without Tiber. Sam Yazga, Max's son, agrees with Lang's account. Yazga's land formed a natural bowl sloping down to Filipini Pond on the land's north side. The stage would be set up at the bottom of the hill with Filipini Pond forming a backdrop. The pond would become a popular skinny dipping destination. The organizers once again told Bethel authorities they expected no more than 50,000 people. Despite resident opposition and signs proclaiming, buy no milk, stop Max's hippie music festival, Bethel town attorney Frederick W. V. Shatt and building inspector Donald Clark approved the permits, but the Bethel town board refused to issue them formally. Clark was ordered to post stop work orders. Free Festival the late change in venue did not give the festival organizers enough time to prepare. At a meeting three days before the event, organizers felt they had two options. One was to complete the fencing and ticket booths, without which the promoters would lose any profit or go into debt. The other option involved putting their remaining available resources into building the stage, without which the promoters feared they would have a disappointed and disgruntled audience. When the audience began arriving, by the tens of thousands the next day, the Wednesday before the weekend, the decision was made for them. Those without tickets simply walked through gaps in the fences, and the organizers were forced to make the event free of charge. Though the festival left its promoters nearly bankrupt, their ownership of the film and recording rights more than compensated for the losses after the release of the hit documentary film in 1970. The Festival the influx of attendees to the rural concert site in Bethel created a massive traffic jam, fearing chaos as thousands began descending on the community. Bethel did not enforce its codes. Eventually, announcements on radio stations as far away as New FM in Manhattan and descriptions of the traffic jams on television news discouraged people from setting off to the festival. Arlo Guthrie made an announcement that was included in the film saying that the New York State Thruway was closed. The director of the Woodstock Museum discussed below said this never occurred. To add to the problems and difficulty in dealing with the large crowds, recent trains had caused muddy roads and fields. The facilities were not equipped to provide sanitation or first aid for the number of people attending. Hundreds of thousands found themselves in a struggle against bad weather, food shortages, and poor sanitation. On the morning of Sunday, August 17, New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller called festival organizer John Roberts and told him he was thinking of ordering 10,000 New York State National Guard troops to the festival. Roberts was successful in persuading Rockefeller not to do this. Sullivan County declared a state of emergency. During the festival, personnel from nearby Stewart Air Force Base assisted in helping to ensure order and airlifting performers in and out of the concert venue. Jimi Hendrix was the last act to perform at the festival, because of the rain delays that Sunday. When Hendrix finally took the stage it was 8.30 Monday morning. The audience, which had peaked at an estimated 400,000 during the festival, was now reduced to about 30,000 by that point. 
Many of them merely waited to catch a glimpse of Hendrix before leaving during his performance. Hendrix and his new band, Gypsy Sun and Rainbows performed a two-hour set. His psychedelic rendition of the U.S. national anthem, The Star Spangled Banner, occurred about three quarters into the set. The song would become part of the 60s zeitgeist, as it was captured forever in the Woodstock film. Hendrix's image performing this number wearing a blue beaded white leather jacket with fringe and a red head scarf has since been regarded as a defining moment of the 1960s, although the festival was remarkably peaceful given the number of people and the conditions involved. There were two recorded fatalities, one from insulin usage, and another caused in an accident when a tractor ran over an attendee sleeping in a nearby hayfield. There also were two births recorded at the event and four miscarriages. Oral testimony in the film supports the overdose and run over deaths and at least one birth, along with many logistical headaches. Yet, in tune with the idealistic hopes of the 1960s, Woodstock satisfied most attendees. There was a sense of social harmony, which, with the quality of music, and the overwhelming mass of people, many sporting bohemian dress, behavior, and attitudes, helped to make it one of the enduring events of the century. After the concert, Max Yasga, who owned the site of the event, saw it as a victory of peace and love. He spoke of how nearly half a million people filled with potential for disaster, riot, looting, and catastrophe spend the three days with music and peace on their minds. He stated, if we join them, we can turn those adversities that are the problems of America today into a hope for a brighter and more peaceful future. Sound Sound for the concert was engineered by sound engineer Bill Hanley. It worked very well, he says of the event. I built special speaker columns on the hills and did 16 louder speaker arrays in a square platform going up to the hill on 70-foot towers. We set it up for 150,000 to 200,000 people. Of course, 500,000 showed up. Altec designed marine plywood cabinets that weighed half a ton apiece, and stood six feet tall, almost four feet deep and three feet wide. Each of these enclosures carried four 15 and JBLD 140 loudspeakers. The tweeters consisted of four times two cell and two times ten cell Altec horns. Behind the stage were three transformers providing 2,000 amperes of current to power the amplification setup. For many years this system was collectively referred to as the Woodstock bins. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?